RX Television on RXMuscle.com. This is Iron Debate, again, on RXMuscle.com. If you're watching us for the first time on YouTube, hit the subscribe button below. Like this video. You're not going to miss any future episodes of Iron Debate, any of our informational topics. Ask Dave, our Daily Muscle in the Morning, all our shows, news updates, and segments. Last episode, we talked about what makes a good prep coach. Obviously, we had a little score to settle between Thackeray Muberic, who we're going to introduce in just a minute, as well as Matt Porter. But then we got into some of the finer points as to what makes a good prep coach and what makes a good prep coach good for a particular individual athlete. Well, today we're going to dive a little deeper into the prep coach topic, and we're going to talk about the style, whether simplicity trumps over more complex uh, equations when it comes to prepping an athlete. But first we go to our Cape Coral studios and bring in Dave Palumbo. Dave, a continuation of the prep coach theme from last Iron Debate. Yeah, you know, we got a lot of great feedback. I told you I'd always wanted to do this show. It started out as a little controversial between Matt and Factory, but it was really a show about what makes a good coach and how to pick a coach. And I wanted to go further into the, into the topic. And uh, I was talking with the uh, Phil Viz on uh, Facebook, and we were talking about, you know, going back and forth. He's friends with Matt, and, um, you know, he, was, he brought up a good topic. He said a lot of coaches think it's, it's better to make things very simple. And he said, I, he goes, I'm the opposite. I like to make things complex and, and to get very scientific. I said, you know, that's another great debate. I said, let's talk about what, if it's better to make things easy, or is it better to make things more complex? And uh, let's get some points of view. So Fizz, Phil agreed to come on the show. Obviously, I got fact back, and of course, Chris, and uh, I'm interested to hear what everyone has to say. I Obviously, I got a strong opinion about it as well. So let's go around the horn, introduce our panel. First, we go to Queens, New York, and bring him in second episode in a row. That is Factory Muberic. Then we go up to Portland, Maine, the man they call the technician, Chris Aceto, and then we bring in... The man from New Jersey, Phil Viz, who Dave just mentioned, uh, it was his topic on Facebook. That's the impetus of this episode. So first, Phil, we're going to go to you on this one. As Dave just mentioned, you slightly go more towards, you know, a more scientific approach. Last episode, we talked about what made a good prep coach, and you know, there was seemed to be some agreement. Uh, Phil, do we have you? I think we lost. All right, I think we just <laughs> lost Phil on that one. So you know what? We're going to go to Factory first on this one. Factory, you, of course, are one of the more visible coaches in the industry. When you work with an athlete, do you try to keep things simple? Do you try to go with a more scientific approach? Right, uh, actually, you know, we got, we got Phil back, so I want to go to Phil first because it was his topic that uh, brought about this particular episode. Phil, so again, last episode we talked about what made a good prep coach. Um, and whether or not, you know, the familiarity with an athlete made for a better prep coach or simple baseline knowledge, where do you fall on that before we go into uh, your side of the argument between simplicity and more complex? Well, I mean, first we have to consider what we're dealing with. Um, anatomy, physiology, kinesiology, um, pharmacology, have been simple to have that. Um, I wouldn't be a doctor with simple knowledge regarding those fields and you know, 95 percent of the people that we're going to deal with you know they're not perfect genetic specimens they all have something wrong they deal with digestive disorders they deal with muscular imbalances they have life issues there's many different things we're going to have to feel um basic would be beautiful uh, you know keeping it really simple if we were dealing with perfect specimens um luckily uh you know chris has built the type of reputation where he gets to pick and choose who he wants to deal with but a lot of the people he deals with nowadays are perfect specimens but back in the day i'm sure he's had to deal with much more difficult cases dealing with general public but um i wouldn't want to go to a doctor with simple simple knowledge but the fact of the matter is i also don't want to explain to me how it works i want him to tell me how to fucking fix it so while it's our job to deal with the complexity <coughs> have, you know advanced knowledge in this field we break it down and keep it simple for the client but it's never ever been simple topics and we have so many uh, different you know issues that come up you know an array of different things that happen throughout prep where we have to find a solution for it and uh, keeping it simple and having just basic knowledge, not going to get that done. Phil, st move back a little bit. You're a little too close to the camera. Thanks. I, I, I apologize. I told you I can't see. My eyes are still a little blurry. Hey, hey, can, can I ask you guys a question? Was, was Phil breaking up a little bit or was just that my phone? Yeah, he's breaking up a little bit. 
Okay, okay, cool. So you guys hear me? You guys hear me clearly? Yeah, we, we hear you perfectly. So, so let's go back to you because, again, we were talking about a topic that you brought up on Facebook, uh, which pits simplicity against a more complex approach. You seem to be more inclined to more comp- – what do you mean by a complex approach? Again, you just mentioned that when you explain things to clients, as all coaches would, Hold you're on. explaining it in a manner they, they can understand, they can comprehend – but talk to the audience a little bit about what you mean by having a more complex approach when it comes to prepping your clients. Well, when I mean when I say I have a complex approach, what I mean is I have a complex um, base of knowledge uh, on each individual topic. If we're going to utilize, say, diuretics, I want to know the mechanisms of action and exactly how they work. Because if we encounter issues or something not working correctly, I want to be able to break it down and isolate what the issue is rather than you know, changing three or four variables that might not get the job done. I want to understand exactly how it works because the more in-depth your knowledge and understanding of something is, the better you're going to be able to control it. Fat Grill is good to you. Where do you fall on this one as far as using a more simple approach as opposed to a more complex approach when prepping your clients? Um, all right. So <clears throat> basically, it's like being a, a financial planner and being broke. You know everything about financial planning, but you're broke. <laughs> it's basically being a business school teacher, and you know everything about business, but you can't even run a business. You know, that's what we're looking at right now. Um, as far as me prepping genetically gifted athletes, not sure where that came from, because if you could name me five genetically gifted athletes that I took on just for pro cards, um, that would probably be a lot. Uh, I mean, it's simple. You have to have an eye for it. You have to have knowledge, but it's simple. Chris, what's the question, (laughs) Seth? No, I, I, I mean, I. There's a. Should should things be simple or easy, or easy or simple? I think it it comes down to the, the the approach that you're using. When putting yeah. together a plan, when putting well, together an approach for one of your clients. Well, I think probably if you speak to four different people, they probably have four different ways, you know, amongst themselves of doing things. And probably amongst each coach, there's consistency, you know, within their the way, the approach that they individually handle people that they work with. Um, I mean, I'm a, I'm a big believer in keeping anything simple um, because I think the devil's in the details. You know, a lot of times when you get into, you know, you know, eat an app, you know, you can have a, you know, 60 gram whey shake and an apple of, you know, some people get into, is it a green apple or, you know, do you mean a, a red apple? Is it a Macintosh or, you know, or, or, or is it a, you know, do you want to, can I substitute apple sauce? You know, can I, can I have, uh, you know, apple juice, you know, I mean, you can make things more complicated than they need be in, in anything. Um, and, and, I, and I agree with Fakhri in that, um, you know, I think he was pointing out that there's, there's book smart and there's, there's, there's experience and wisdom. Yes. And, I, and, I, and I think that, you know, in, in prepping people for a bodybuilding show, uh, a lot of people, you know, will make fun of me because, you know, I'm not, I'm not a science type guy. I've often said I hate science. And I, I say that to make fun of myself and to be self-deprecating. Of course, you have to have a science, you know, some type of science background. I mean, I, I, honestly, I went to school for applied exercise science. I got straight 100% A's. I graduated number one in my class. School was very easy for me. I loved it. And the longer that I've been involved in bodybuilding, the less I've even thought of really science stuff because I'm using, you know, a compilation and collection of years of having done it where I'm using or I'm relying on, you know, having been there, having done that, regardless of like the science stuff. And, you know, I'm, I'm trying to tap into like being wise or having some wisdom in terms of helping somebody get ready for a bodybuilding show. So I think that, you know, in the world we're in now, you know, people, a lot of people want to say, no, you have to go, you know, strict science, 
you know, and if you you know if you if you don't follow the this the, the scientific method of contest prep, and if you don't know the the ins and outs of you know carbohydrate metabolism and, and protein synthesis, and you know if you don't know all the pathways of fats and all these things, then you're no good. Um, yep. And and that's you know personally what I. I don't have a problem with because it, it doesn't bother me, but I would say that you know people who take a exclusive science approach are walking down the wrong path. Bill, okay. um, Chris, how many pa- how many pages is your book? Um, over a hundred. Yeah. You call that simple? Yes, it was a very simple read. Well, I, I I get the fat loss book, which is you know very complex issues, and I talked about actually if you read that book. That was 1996. Nobody was nobody was talking about insulin responses and speed of carbohydrates. No one in 1996. So I was, um, you know, th- there's science there. I'm not saying science is not important. I'm just saying that, um, you know, personally me, I would rel- rely on my experience more than think about consciously, like, you know. The science part of well, the I, bodybuilding thing. It's just I, like, you know, you know, I mean, I, I, know, I know people who sell real estate. They can't do what I do. Uh, I know people who I buy stocks from. I wouldn't. I mean, I just use them as an intermediary. I mean, I, I don't consider them having wisdom and knowledge in terms of investing. Those are my incredible, you know, those are my hobby, bodybuilding, those are my hobbies outside of bodybuilding. So, you know, there's the book smarts to investing, and then there's making money. And well, there's the book smarts to contest prep, and there's being successful. Fellas, get you back in. Again, you're content. But go ahead. I, I didn't mean to, honestly, Phil, I didn't, I, I'm sorry. No, if I no, no it's going. perfectly okay. You know, you had some great points to make. And honestly, I agree with both you and fact. Um, you do need a certain degree, degree of experience and application. However, I do believe you should have a base of knowledge before you go into that application. Um, you guys both have 20 years experience. So, you know, that experience is going to make you more advanced. When I used to run personal training departments, and I've run some of the most successful tra- training departments in the history of New York City, whenever somebody would come to me for an interview, they would throw their resume at me as far as I have this certification and that one. And I would say, I don't give a fuck what your certification is. Show me you can do the job. So... Um, I believe you do have to have a strong base of knowledge and education, which, Chris, you've shown that you do with your degree and even in the books that you've written. Um, those books are not simple. They have that you simplified the lesson. Yes, you made it look simple and explained it simply, which is, which is a sign that you understand the lesson very well. But those are not simple topics or simple lessons whatsoever. You do have a strong background base of, of knowledge and uh, education into uh, science. And I, I bought your book when I was 20. I followed you for a long time. You do what's called playing possum. You, you satirize and make fun of yourself and play dumb, but you're really good. I've seen some of your programs. I've talked That's to people you. that first with you, and I know you're very educated. I think he's so a dope, you actually. Education that you play well, your experience. I, I can list the people I'm smarter than, Dave, so if you need that list, I'll... <laughs> Let's get Dave in here. Dave, uh, again, we're talking about the simple, simple approach against a complex approach. You were very passionate when you read what Phil wrote on Facebook. Mm-hmm. What do you say? Chris is the, the dumbest, smartest guy I know. And the reason I say that is because he's so smart that he makes himself look dumb. Einstein used to do that too, and, but yet he's brilliant in the same sense because he's taken these complex scientific, uh, I guess you say certainties, and he's made them so easy that he can manipulate them. You don't even think he knows what he's talking about. Uh, Bob Grushkin, you learned that from Bob, and I know Bob, would, you, you'd see this fat, out of shape, old Jewish guy, and you're like, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. But he was brilliant. But he made it so simple that you, he's like, oh, I'll have a chicken breast. I'll make you this. So go, go, have a, go have a muffin. And you're like, what the hell is this guy talking about? But it was brilliant because he actually had his, the wheels were turning in his brain. And that's what I always said. The, the greatest teacher, the greatest coaches are the people who have a ton of knowledge in their head who have been able to utilize that knowledge and, and present it in such a simplistic fashion to the people who are there teaching or the people who they're working with, that the people who they're working with and being taught don't even realize how complex what they're being taught it, it actually is. And that's what I do with my Secrets to Becoming a Diet Guru course. I mean, I've been talking about nutrition and, and supplementation and performance enhancing drugs for 25 years now. So for me, I don't have to sit down and figure the math of how many, people ask me, how many calories is this diet you gave me? I'm like, I don't know. 
It doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. You, you know, the only people who have to calculate calories and macros, you know, to the actual half a gram, are those people who are just starting out, who are unsure of themselves, who want to present a, uh, I guess you could say, a, a front to people to let them know, hey, I'm smart. When you're smart and you know it and, you, and you've experienced, you don't have to prove to anyone that you're smart anymore. You're, the results Reed. speak for themselves. And I think that that's what Fakhry uh, and Chris, uh, their experience and the people they work with and the results just speak for themselves. There's, there's got to be knowledge behind that. Phil, I want to go back to you real quick because, again, you seem to be, um, again, from what you what you've commented, your approach seems to be a little bit more on the scientific method. And I'm not saying that negates the experience angle of it, but do you think there is a fine line between what Dave and Chris are saying in terms of the experience factor and then what it is that you're introducing, and that is a more complex understanding of you know the science behind prepping an athlete, depending on what it is that they're looking to do? Because let's face it, you know, you have athletes that are looking to push the envelope, whereas you have athletes who are looking to take a more slow and steady approach over the long term. Everybody has different needs. Where do you fall on that? Well, I just want to point out real quick, a little bit off topic, that Dave just quoted Einstein as far as simplifying complex uh, situations. That was actually Richard Feynman, uh, famed uh, physicist that died in 1988. He, uh, he basically stated that if you can't explain, explain something simply and break it down so the simplest mind can understand it, you don't understand the lesson well enough. You're right. So I, or that was properly quoted. But um, as far as understand the complexities of things, um, I am never going to apply something to somebody that I don't fully understand. Um, you know, we might understand the basics of how carbohydrates work, balancing protein intake, and the w people's response based on experience. We could do that with trial and error through experience. And, you know, any intelligent mind is going to get a pretty good hang of that. But um, the fact of the matter is we're not dealing with, you know, highly responsive individuals for the majority. You know, a lot of them are unresponsive, and they're unresponsive for numerous reasons. We hit roadblocks with body fat. You can't just cut calories down and bump and uh, bump cardio up and create more of a deficit and hope they're just going to keep leaning. Because a lot of the time, that's not going to happen. Sure, that's going to happen a good majority of the time. Absolutely, I won't disagree with that. But what about the instances you encounter where that's not going to work? What are you going to do? Um, you got to know, you know, you got to know different things that are going to affect fat loss, for example. Um, estrogen, estrogen balance, for example. A lot of coaches like to shut estrogen completely down. And that's actually shown to impede uh, lipolysis and fat burning. But still, a lot of them do it. They'll have, they'll have the client taking uh, aromacin and uh, arimidex and letrozole, and they're just literally crashing estrogen. And what that's also going to do is it's going to uh, it's going to uh, alter neurotransmitter function. It's going to alter their moods. They're going to their moods are going to change. They're going to be either more aggressive or, or more demotivated, or like I said, depending on, depending on the person, their job, um, and how they respond. You could fuck up their mental state, and as you know, your mental state is going to control everything. So if you have a demotivated client or somebody who's moody or struggling or stress and cortisol is elevating, they're going to hit roadblocks. They're going to they're going to stall. You've got to know how to make sure you not only can fix these problems, but you've also got to know how to not cause them in the first place. And a lot of times it, it happens by accident because the coach doesn't know enough about what they're doing. I've seen a lot of protocols where they're basically, you know, they throw and paint at the wall and hoping it sticks because they know the basics. But if you don't know the complexities, for example, when somebody has um, anxiety at equipoise, do you do, do a lot of people know that equipoise um, causes a depletion of GABA in the brain, which is a calming hormone, which would which would prevent um, which would prevent anxiety. So if your client's sitting there telling you, "I got anxiety on EQ," what do you do? Just cut it out, or do you fix the problem? So there's a number of things we can encounter like that. Now I know Factory's laughing because I don't have experience, I don't have his track record, which I will admit, but I also haven't had the opportunity yet. So once I have the opportunity to be a level playing field, we can compare uh, resumes a little bit more quick. But without a strong, go right ahead. <laughs> Zachary. Okay. Um, Phil, you've been competing since at least 2007. So that gives you 10 years of experience. Um, I've been prepping people since 2008. So let's say that gives me 10 years of experience. I have 69 pro cards. Not sure how many you have. You're a very intelligent guy. I give you that. How has your intelligence helped you compete and your clients win? Well, at this point, everybody, a lot of my, uh, my personal issues are insecurity and psychological. Um, I've always had an issue since I was young with my own personal performance. I place a lot of pressure on myself. I tend to panic at the end, do something stupid, or even fall apart just because I panic. Uh, if you know anything about fight or flight response, um, 
that causes your body to immediately dump glycogen so you can spill just by getting panicked without touching anything. So I've had a lot of insecurity issues with my own performance, and that's a lot of the reason why I failed. That's the reason why I try to go up to super heavyweight and prove I'm bigger than I actually am when I should stay down at heavyweight, which I've done more than once. Just uh, basically a fear of failure, trying to prove everybody wrong rather than trying to prove myself right. So these are psychological mistakes I've made, not tactical. Um, I don't make these mistakes often with my clients. Um, I don't compete people often simply because I won't put somebody on stage until they're ready, and I haven't had a large influx of people that are far along in their bodybuilding career. So I've got years of building with a lot of these guys. But as I do put my guys on stage, if you watch for the most part, I have a very, very high percentage of nailing it with my clients. They all come in with glutes. They all come in dry. They all come in peak. They all look very, very good. Um, I've had a couple people basically leave me and um, basically in a few short months turn pro into somebody else where I did the majority of the work. I'm not going to name names. But, you know, um, I guess they think somebody with a higher reputation and more experience, the grass is always greener type situation. But, again, I'm sure you guys have encountered that, too. You do so much work with somebody. They leave you last minute. They win under somebody else when you did all the work, and then they take the credit, and you're like, motherfucker. You know, and I'm sure you've gotten clients that way as well, but I haven't been in this very long. So the majority of the people that I'm dealing with are projects that are going to be long term. So as you see me putting my people into the shows, you can review all of my clients across the board and tell me what they look like compared to what they used to and how advanced their progress has been. Because I've done very, very good across the board with nearly everybody. I have almost <coughs> no advocates whatsoever. And I'm going to keep improving as I gain experience and as I gain notoriety. And with experience and notoriety, uh, you're going to get higher quality caliber athletes. And then I believe when you apply advanced knowledge and, and skill to a higher advanced athlete, you're going to get even better results as you've seen with Chris. So what, what, what five top clients would you consider your top five? That way we could take a look at them and see what they look like. All right. Uh, well, I could start with Henry Jackson, who uh, has won the Junior USA. He won the Amateur Olympia this past uh, year in Vegas. Uh, two um, foreigners got pro cards. They didn't award him the third. He's going to be coming into USA this year. Um, he, he's about six foot two, uh, 290, almost 300 pounds right now with a 32 inch waist and some of the craziest genetics you'll ever see. Very, very hard working. Never came into a show with glutes before uh, we, Before he came with me. We put on a lot of muscle. We've uh, corrected a leg imbalance, and he's going to be very impressive. He's somebody to work at, watch out for. Um, one of my clients, Taylor, won, three, won his class three times last year um, in the Super what, uh, what, what What shows were that? Were they national shows? Were they top national no, shows? Oh, no, they were local shows. Okay. I had uh, I, a client that's no longer with me. I had Mike Charles last year take uh, third in that. Uh, not uh, last year, not this, not this past year, the year before, took third at Nationals. Um, he tore his hamstring a week out from North American this year, still ended up managing seventh place. Um, so he, he, I took him from 10th uh, at Eastern, which is a regional show, to third nationally in two years. Um, I, I, I think, I think, let me, I want to cut in for a second. Phil, you don't need to prove yourself. I mean, I, I think you, you made your point. I think that, you know, I think what the important point here is, is to bring up, is I want to bring up, is that. Knowledge is important, and look, no one educates people more in our industry than I do. I mean, with Ask Dave and all the educational programming that I do, and the breaking down the science of what's going on, and endocrinologically, uh, physiologically, hormone-related, supplement-related, diet, you know, I'm the first, I'm the ketogenic diet guy, I mean, so, I mean, I, I quantify everything, but in my head, I take that, those very complex you know, con uh, concepts and I try to make them simplistic and, and apply them in a simplistic manner, uh, even though I might be doing a lot of calculating in my head. To me, it's important to educate you know, your clients, but it's not important to give them a college education. In other words, I don't have to prove to them that I'm, that, that I'm smarter than I am. So sometimes, uh, I think the issue is, are we overthinking things? Are we overanalyzing? And here's my question to Chris. Is this overanalyzation sometimes detrimental to the to the client to the the person you're coaching? Can you overanalyze things because you get too nervous at the end? You're working with an important person and you actually you, you screw things up. Well, Fakri and Phil can tell you, I'm sure, and agree with me that usually it's the athlete that you know overanalyzes things. You know, I, I think a good prep coach he might, you know. He might be self-reflective at a minimum, and he may analyze, you know, okay, why is this guy, you know, two weeks gone by, he really looks the same. Um, so he may, you know, try to analyze why. But uh, I think the athlete is the one who can 
have a complete meltdown by analyzing because he's the one who's right, gets up in the morning, takes off his shirt, looks in the mirror, I'm flat. Next day, looks in the mirror, I'm full. Next day, looks in the mirror, I'm flat, but not as lean. Now I'm, getting, I'm losing weight, uh, but not even getting harder. So it's it's the overanalyzing. For me, it would be the overanalyzation by an athlete who pro, who's unfortunately tries to project that, which I always reject. I say, that's your problem. Don't tell me about those issues. <laughs> you know, they try to project it onto me by saying, you know, you know, I'm flat, but I'm full, but I'm watering my hand. I said, you know, I don't really care. Just, you know, I don't care what you think, you know, because it's it's really invaluable. I mean, it's not valuable because otherwise, if it, if it you know, if it really was that valuable, you probably wouldn't be using a prep coach. You know what I mean? You'd be able to wing it on your own. So um, I think there's a big danger in overanalyzing it. I mean, think if it, if it was a, it, it would be like a Woody Allen movie, if, you know what I mean? You could, you know, you could overanalyze into the infinitesimal, you know, death spiral, you know, and Phil will tell you if, if he's prepping someone, he probably doesn't overanalyze, but what he's prepping himself, right? Here's a question for Factory. Let me ask you this question. Um, I'm a big believer the last week of contest prep to do as little as possible because I feel that people just screw things up when they start making too many changes that last week. Matter of fact, I make the, the least amount of changes until like that very last day. Um, how do you feel about people who have like these protocols that are like 100, you know, 100 line items long and what to do that last week? Yeah, man, it fucks people up. You know, I mean, if, if, if you're, if, you know, if you're Albert Einstein and, and you're trying to prep somebody you know, you, you're not going to look at them the way that, you know, you should with your eyes. You're going to overanalyze people because, you know, you have your scientific theories um, or hypotheses, rather, because theories are unproven that, you know, this is going to work and we have to take out water. And if you have anxiety, you have to put in GABA for EQ and this and that, that and this, you know, yeah, that's that's where people fuck up. That is where people fuck up the last week. I mean, you know, the last week is the most important week of the, of the whole entire prep. And, you know, let's, let, let, let's realize what we're talking about here. We're talking about a sport. A sport. A sport you're supposed to win. Okay? We're not talking about being in college. Okay? Because I graduated with 3.7 GPA in college. I have a master's degree. I've written articles for Flex Magazine and Muscular Development for years. <laughs> And if anybody wants to question my my intelligence, go read my articles. So we're talking about a sport that we're here to win. At the end of the day, winners win. Phil, let me go back to you on this one. Just in terms of what Fakri just explained, in a situation where you're talking about the last week prep, right? And obviously you're going to have an athlete. And I kind of also want to backtrack to the last episode that we have because we went around the horn and what seemed to be universally agreed upon was that a prep coach is more than just somebody who's just writing at your protocol. They become your shrink. They become your best friend. They become your mentor, so on and so forth. And I'm sure you, as someone who, you know, in comparison to Chris, Fackery, and Dave, relatively new to the scene, you've had to experience that. In those kind of pressure situations, those clutch situations last week, in your opinion, what do you have more of a leg to stand on when you try to explain something? That scientific background, look, look, guys, I know what I'm doing here. Or what Fakhri is pointing out and the fact that like, okay, look, I have a track record. I've experienced of having done this, this, this. So just, you know, agree with what I'm telling you. Well, I'm saying, well, I'm saying, well, I'm saying I have an eye. I'm saying you have to have an eye to prep. It's not a track record because I don't have nothing written on paper. I can't give somebody say, this is your last 10 day of prep. My eyes and my knowledge is what separates me from most coaches. Right. You know? Okay. So again, it's the experience of what he's developed in terms of over the course of his years. What do you say to that? Well, I believe you should keep it simple in the final final weeks, and that's absolutely essential. However, like you said, we're you know a psychologist as well as so you have to consider the psychological side of it. And I've personally experienced how uh, what your fight or flight response can do due to stress to you. So I try to make the final week as le as little stress as possible. I don't give I don't openly offer lessons to people. However, if they ask me how something works, I will explain it. And if they ask deeper, I will go deeper. I can explain deeply and in depth anything that i possibly apply and i can make it understandable and comprehensible to them and that puts their mind at ease sometimes understanding it 
what I also do in the final week of the show is I will map out every little detail on the program. Now, if you actually think about it, I do everything very, very simple. I don't try to do a million things at once. I will load you. I will then wa work on water manipulation, diuretic application, and then the finishing touches. But I do it one step at a time. I don't try to add carbs, cut water, add diuretics, and play with a bunch of things because if something goes wrong, how do you know which variable is responsible? So what I do is I'll give them a base plan where I map out every little detail, and that puts their mind at ease because they're never unsure of anything. And I tell them, this still is, is still is subject to change based on what I see hour to hour closer to the show. But this is what we're generally going to go off of, and that generally eases their mind and gives them some sort of comfort and keeps their mind stable because if your stress response goes off, um, now I'm, I'm going to go a little bit into science here. Um, this is something that I'm working on learning a little bit more about and controlling. But your PNS versus your FNS, your sympathetic nervous system versus your parasympathetic, they can't both be active at the same time. So if you get nervous and your fight flight goes off, your digestive tract shuts down. Dave has actually mentioned this in regards to intro workout uh, drinks. If you're training too hard and um, your nervous system goes off, one shuts down while the other one picks up. So if that person gets stressed, there's nothing you can put into their body to fix the problem. Your digestive tract and your, and your uh, physiological system is shut down in favor of your fight or flight response. So if that person gets too nervous, there's no water manipulation, no diuretics, no carbohydrates that are going to fix the problem. You have to keep them calm before anything else. So whatever it takes to get that person calm, be it texting them hourly, calling them on the phone, laying out a long plan with, with a step-by-step -step process, and then staying closely in touch with them and holding their hand to keep them calm is is... is is primary to me and, and you know comes first and foremost then i worry about all the manipulation a lot of times very very if no manipulations are necessary as long as that person's calm and confident factory I think, I think, real quick before i go to chris factory yeah. again based off what phil just said again, you are a, a coach that again you work with up-and-comers but you do work with you know some more seasoned uh, bodybuilders as well do you find that because they trust who you are they trust who you're, I guess, I don't want to use the word track record based on what you said, but your experience. Do they ask you less questions based on more experience, their level of experience in those pressure situations or not really? Are all athletes in that kind of same boat when it comes down to it in the last 10 days? Well, to keep somebody calm, they have to be in shape. So if, if, they're, if, they're, if they're in shape, they shouldn't be nervous. So that's what the last 11 weeks or 15 weeks is before a show to get somebody in shape, you know? So yeah, you're in shape. So now what do we got to do? Well, let's say we have to carb you up. Let's say we have to carb you down. Let's say we have to add water. Let's say we have to do this. Let's say we have to do that. It's that simple. If you're in shape, there's no need to, to you know, to, 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 to drive somebody nuts. Because, like Chris just finished explaining, the athlete goes nuts. So imagine the coach coming up with these Wikipedia scientific, you know, explanations for the actual athlete, you know. So now the athlete's nervous. He's hearing shit that he can't even decipher himself. And he's, in, he, he's about to step on stage. Just get just get him in shape. You get him in shape, and then the last week you get him, you know, ripped, dry, hard, and ripped, and ready to win. Well, That's the I, bottom line. The bottom line is to win. I think you misunderstood my uh, my explanation a little bit. I said I explain to calm their mind if they ask. I don't openly offer these things and try to confuse them and give them more to think about than they need. But I absolutely do agree. If you're in shape, you should be more confident. However, a lot of times these people are coming up from the beginning. They've never been in shape before. They've never competed. They don't know who's showing up, you know, so they're a little bit nervous, especially if it's somebody who works very, very hard or if somebody is coming from insecure background, which is the majority of this industry. You know, a lot of people get in the gym because they were insecure and this is their opportunity to prove to themselves that they're somebody. So yeah, you can't always control how nervous somebody gets regardless of if they are in shape. Um, I've been in pretty good shape and falling apart and I've proven it. I've shown before, afters, videos, no angles, no crazy lighting, no filters that I can get in shape, but I can still fuck it up last minute. So you can fuck it up. People know this. Now, the reason why you don't explain a lot to people is because people pick coaches based on what their needs and preferences are. So people come to you because you get shit done and you keep it simple. A lot of people come to me because I can explain these things and because I am known to be very, very in-depth 
with, with science and it helps them calm their minds and understand things a little bit better. So they're sure that what I'm telling them is, is it makes sense. So I get a lot of people that like that explanation, whereas you may not. So the, the type of coach you are is going to determine what type of client you attract. Well, Factory, that's kind of where I was going with this as well with you. Do you find that your athletes in particular, because again, they come to you because of your reputation, your results, and so on and so forth. Do you find that they're asking you less of those kind of questions in those pressure situations? I've worked with so many novices that I've turned pro that I've never stepped on stage. I've worked, you know, Jose Filbert, who, who won men's physique, he turned pro in two or three weeks last year. You know, I mean, I've worked with people that have turned pro in a couple of weeks, one show and into the pro card. You know, I, I, I don't know where this whole uh, thing that people come to me that already are about to turn pro come to me. No, that's not I, right, No, that's not true at all. You know, I mean, I've worked with Dennis James on his on his comeback. I worked with Tony Freeman a couple of times when Sean Roden made that big, you know, transition to one of the top and top competitors in the world. Um, people come to me because, you know, I keep it simple. I'm old school. Let's 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 look at the golden age of bodybuilding. Let's look at the 1990s and the early 2000s. Do you really? Oh, Chris is right there. Hey, Chris, do you really think that Jay Cutler, Sean Ray, Ronnie Coleman, and all these guys thought about anything that Phil's talking about? Um, Jay was just you know I can vouch for Jay. He was just a robot. You know, so it was just you know maniacal hard work. Uh, tunnel vision. I think if you ask Jay right now, you know, to look back at his career, he would say at the height of his like where he was just making gains by like you know you know when you're making gains by like the month, like a month goes by and you're like, Fuck, I'm bigger and harder for sure. And you know, I think he was in a a tunnel that was so tight, you know, that he could not even. It take him to this day to to be able to explain how tight that tunnel was, you know. And I don't know if that answers your question. You know, did was he interested in the science? You know, we worked very close together, and I, you know, I gave him the basics, and you know, he obviously had the genetics and the the crazy drive to get to where he wanted to go. But um, you know, interestingly, I know this is not part of the topic. You know, to be in a tunnel like that. And to be able to achieve his level of, I mean, if you look at Jay, some of his looks, right? 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004, they were like a level of density and hardness and separation that was pretty damn impressive. Um, there was no social media. Isn't that interesting? I mean, to stay in the tunnel as the athlete, there was no social media, which I think has a negative impact on the way people look these days. Well, can, I, can I ask a couple questions? First of all, uh, fact referred to Ronnie Coleman. One of my clients is married to somebody who dated Ronnie Coleman during his reign. Um, the, the protocols that he got from Chad Nichols through facts were 15 pages long. That sounds pretty complex to me. And I know Chad Nichols is a science guy. Um, I've seen more than one of his programs. They're long as fuck and they're very detailed. But Chad Nichols, one of the best coaches that's ever lived, is very, very complex and very in-depth with science. I believe he's a certified nutritionist. Um, now, as far as uh, genetics... Can, can, I, can I answer that? Because you said that was a question. Good. Okay, so you're talking about in-depth and scientific. Well, I've written pages and pages and hundreds of articles for Muscle Development and Flex Magazine. So that excites my uh, my knowledgeable that I could write a 15-page report for an athlete. But Chad did not talk to Ronnie to call him that way. Because Ronnie, as we know, was not a scientific guy. <laughs> no. <laughs> His coach, his coach laid out long, complex plans. Yeah, but you fizz, uh, Phil, the, the plans that, that Chad laid out were just like, you're going to go to the bathroom at 6 o'clock, and you're going you're gonna to eat at, at 6.30. And well, it was gonna, a double because space. Because if, if he didn't write that out, Ronnie would forget to do it. That's why. They weren't complex. It was just basic instructions you know, on how to live. That's terribly funny. <laughs> and then, you know, nowadays, you mentioned the Internet, you mentioned social media. That, you know, that gives everybody a platform to do more scientific research and, you know, impress more people to get more clients. So that right there to me is, is, is a, you know, a way of getting clients, you know, if you could explain to somebody, 
you know, all the scientific stuff is going to be, oh, wow, this guy's really smart. But if they're not winning, they're going to leave. That's absolutely true. But, again, everybody has to start somewhere. People that go to college, some of the most intelligent minds that we've ever had, they had to learn before they could apply the lesson, right? I want to I want to I want to say one more thing too. Phil, you know, it's interesting. You brought up an interesting topic about people who get very nervous on stage and get stressed out and have anxiety. And I've worked with a lot of people over the years who've had these these issues. And my solution to them is is different than your solution. Your solution is, okay, what can we give them to calm them down and to reduce stress levels and cortisol levels? You know what my my solution is? It's the simpler solution. Take away what's causing that. What's causing that? Too many stimulants, drugs like Trembolone that, that raise anxiety levels, um, a, too, over clenbuterol, taking too much clenbuterol, all things that, that stress the adrenal glands out, stress the, the brain out, you know, raise anxiety levels. I eliminate those drugs in those people because that's easier than trying to give them something else to combat the something else that they're taking. So sometimes the simplistic approach you know, is better than trying to overanalyze what's going on. And, and, and it doesn't, to some people, especially the bodybuilder who likes to take drugs, they don't get that. They don't understand. They, they, don't, say how, they don't see how it's going to solve the problem. But it always does. Bill? Well, no, I, I, think that, I think that what you just said is probably a base, base basic of any good uh, prep coach. If they're not reducing those things in the final yeah. week, those could affect your ability to carb load, dry out, causing vaginal constriction and a number of different issues as well. So if you're not reducing or cutting those things out in the final week anyway, you're probably not a very good coach to begin with. So I didn't even consider those a factor. I can I basically assume that anybody who has the slightest of intelligence is going to reduce those factors. Not, not necessarily. Final. Not necessarily because people increase. I, I usually increase trembolone in guys. A lot, we like to increase trembolone the last week because it makes you look better. But in people who have anxiety disorders, you don't do that because they, they won't sleep. They get stressed out. They start getting paranoid. And, and then that ruins them, you know. I'm writing that down, Dave. Trenbolone makes you look better. <laughs> <laughs> or just have him smoke weed and calm the fuck down. <laughs> All right, Sid, wrap this up. All right, guys, I have Jose Raymond texting me right now. He wants to come on, so this is going to do for this episode of Iron Debate. Special thanks to Phil Viz. I was going to say Jose Raymond. Factory Mover, it, Chris Aceto, Dave Palumbo, and, of course, our producer, Tyler Shore. We have another episode coming up. That one is going to be available shortly on rxmuscle.com and the RX Muscle YouTube channel.